want to talk to you about something that's, uh, that's going to sound pretty political from the very beginning. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, I want to use that for our text tonight. And as we look at this verse, a very familiar verse, a very, very important verse that we apply it to our lives. And I want to talk to you about the supreme race. And when I say that, a lot of people say, well, the white people are the supreme race. Someone else said, no, it's black power, that's the race. And then someone else said, no, it's brown power. And somebody else may say, well, it's yellow power or whatever, but they have all these different things. Uh, some, I guess, would say some sort of rainbow power or whatever. But what is the supreme race? And I think it's important for us to look and see what God says about races. And I, I trust that as we look at what God says in his word, people will help us have a better understanding about the race differences, okay? And help us to see what is the superior race and that we will act according to what we find out tonight. And uh, again, I keep thinking how many times I've heard uh, on the news here in recent days and they'll say that Trump is a white supremacist. And then you'll hear somebody else say, no, Biden is a white supremacist, no. And they go back and forth, back and forth, uh, all this sort of stuff. Of course, that's all kind of political. And, uh, but anyhow, it's, it's sad what we see. And what it does is it causes division. And yes, there is a division that we find when we talk about the race that God wants us to be, uh, the grace that God can give us, whatever race we are to place. But as we look here in Hebrews 11, 6, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, that doesn't say anything about being black, white, or brown, or whatever, does it? It goes on and says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And folks, we need to believe that God is our Heavenly Father, and that he does love us, and he loves us so much that he was willing to take our place so we can go to heaven. Wow. That he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so God wants us to keep our eye on him. And in this case, there's a lot of distractions out there. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to find yourself in trouble. Uh, I was just talking to uh, Kurt Walco the other day. He came out when I was running. And just as he came out, there was this dog coming after me. And he was coming up on his bike. And uh, he just slightly a little faster than me when he was riding the bike. Okay? <laughs> okay, Kurt's a lot better. I mean, I can't believe it. It was like he was... Uh, uh, you know, warping across uh, the park there. I mean, you're, choo, choo, choo. you know, you just hear there everywhere. But anyhow, whatever. But he sidetracked the dog this long enough so that the dog started uh, coming on me. It was after him. So anyhow, of course, maybe he just wants some fresh meat. They want to old meat, you know what I mean? But yeah. whatever. But that same dog I was telling that one day I came out there and all of a sudden I, my dog was right on top of me. And I wasn't prepared, and I went down, and I literally broke my shoulder bone. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bud knows when he started checking, he said, do you know when you broke your shoulder? I said, yeah, I know when. And that dog came at me, and of all lines, there was a fence between me and that dog. But he distracted me just enough so that I lost my balance, and I went down, and I rolled, and I bounced, and everything else. And the right there, and of course, Kurt knows it's, it's slanted like this. And so when I hit, I didn't fall even as I bounced around a bit. And uh, the dog didn't know what to do. Now, of course, he couldn't get through them because he's on the other side of the fence. But still, he distracted me long enough so that I got hurt and also messed up my foot a bit. But what I'm saying is, that's what the devil's doing right now. He's using all these distractions. And, and right now, as you look at the political race and everything else, they're using the race card, aren't they? Over and over and over again. And they're doing everything they can to call the division. So, well, if you're black, you're better than everybody else. But if you're white, you're better than everybody else. And if you're brown, you know, and, and they just go home down the list and just trying to keep each other each other's thrones. Folks are sad because we've been doing really good. I, I hate to, you know, I don't know how it sounds, but we have really done well up to just recently uh, with these things that just started coming to light here and uh, things going on. And, and folks, ready? Black lives do matter, but so do all the other lives too, okay? Right. And so we need to keep that in mind. But here in the scriptures, again, it says very clearly that it's impossible for us to please God without faith. 
And again, God's not necessarily asking us for a pedigree, you know, what our background is. And most of us would be pretty interested to find out how many niches we have in here and how many could maybe give us a, a total of six different races just in your blood bank alone. And uh, anyhow, uh, we, we got a bunch of mutts around here. What do you call them? Heinz 57? Okay. So, but move along here. As we think of this, that there's, again, I want to straighten up this misconception about the superior race. And I trust as we get into our message that you'll realize that God used mixing races in a wonderful way. And yet also we see that the devil used it in a terrible way. And so as we look at these things, I want to just go ahead and, and give you the, the punchline. You ready? There's two races. And you say, no, wait a minute. I can look around and I see all these different people, and different colors and in-between colors and everything else. Uh, and what do you mean there's only two races? Well, there's the saved race and there's the lost race. There's saved humans and there's lost. That's the two races. And I can tell you because in John 3, 16, that God loves both races and he loves the lost race just as much as he lo loves the saved race. And so as we look at God's word, we see it's important for us to, to get things right in our life and to have a right relationship with God to make sure that we're running in the right race for him. The Canaanites and the giants and the wicked, we find them here in Genesis. And uh, Genesis tells us several things about them. But we find that the first race was lost. We find that the reason they were lost is because they were rebel, rebel they were rebels against God. And folks, you can't win. You, you've lost already if you're fighting against God. If you think you have a better program than God's program, you're in trouble. And uh, wow, it, it's frightening how sad so many people think that they've got it all figured out. And then they'll just come on and they'll say something really bold like this. Well, I don't believe in God, so I'm okay. I don't have to work. It's not, I don't believe in God. There's no God there. I'm okay. And they think just because they don't believe that, that it's not going to bother them. And you, you ready for this? You can walk out in front of a diesel truck and say, I don't believe you're real. You can't hurt me. <laughs> Keep on trucking, huh? Uh, and, and what I'm saying, that's how ignorant people are when they say there's no God. Because you look and you see the universe is just so amazing. And constantly they're finding new and more exciting things all the time that they couldn't see before, but because our technology has grown so much, there's things that we're able to find out that we had no idea or even existed. Wow, how exciting when we think of what God is doing. So we see re rebels. They're rebels because they rebel against God's plan. The giants in the earth in those early days, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, tells us about the giants that were in the land. And you really can listen to all team, okay? All right, I want to make it clear. They really were giants in the land. You say, well, how big were they? Well, they were giants, okay? And uh, we'll move on from there. And then it tells us also in the very beginning that the daughters of men were fair and uh, that they were ready in some cases to yield to the saved men. And uh, I think that's interesting. The saved men were what we call the Sethites. The lost were what we would refer to as the Canaanites. And as you look at them, the sons of Seth basically said that when Seth replaced his brother Abel, then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. They began to accept Christ as their Savior. But it's interesting that you read here in Genesis, uh, around Genesis chapter 6 and so forth, you'll see that it says the sons of God, referring to those that were saved, when they saw the daughters uh, uh, of Cain, that they, they fell for them and they went after them. And again, uh, I believe that Cain, and uh, again, I don't have any particular scriptures on this, but I believe by looking at things, that Cain, when God put a mark on him, he said, first of all, Cain said, God, everybody find me is going to kill me. And it was a day of hand to hand combat, basically. And God said, I'll put a mark on you, and no man will kill you. Well, how come suddenly. Here, chapter later, we hear about these giants. Then we hear about the daughters of Cain. Do you think it's possible that maybe God made him a giant? Wow. It could be possible. Where did the giants come from? 
and they were different than the others. And so if he had children, and we know that he knew his wife in the land of God, so it's very likely that the daughters would have probably taken after the dad. They would have been tall. <laughs> they would have been giants themselves. And so you can see where things begin to happen. And as a result, Seth's sons were attracted to these tall ladies, you want to put that way. And we see that things begin to happen that were not good. Genesis 6, 5, put it this way. It says that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So what happened after the fall in the garden and after the first murder from the first son? We see things steadily going down as man turns over to sin and allows sin to rule their life. And folks, that's such a dangerous place to be. And we see that people, even though that were saved, but had their moments that they lived just like they were lost. And we had to realize that a saved man is capable of doing basically any sin that a unsaved person is capable of. And so as we look here in God's word, we see the races very clearly, two races very distinctly before the flood. And again, it was those that were believers and those that were unbelievers. Those that believed in God and followed God's plans and those that didn't. And again, we need to be careful. Just because we're a Christian, we're not exempt from falling into sin. And then those are said rights. And that's the second race, like I said, the saved race. And Genesis chapter 4, uh, verse 25, notice what it says here. Genesis 4, 25. And uh, concerning uh, these particular people. And again, as we look at them, I think it's important for us to realize uh, that man never reaches a place in this life where they're exempt from sin, or they're immune to sin. It just doesn't happen. But notice what it says here, verse 25. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And so pointing out that, that Seth, that's when they began to call on the name of the Lord. It's funny, Abel means uh, vanity, right? Well, we got Cain, and they thought that they'd gotten a man from God, and that Cain was going to be the Savior, that Cain was going to be Jesus, the Messiah. Boy, were they wrong. <laughs> no. And he killed his brother Abel, but then Seth came on the scene to replace his brother Abel. And it says this, And to Seth, the him also were born, son, and he called his name Enos, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. How do you get saved? Well, by acknowledging that you're a sinner. <laughs> and asking the Lord to forgive us of our sins and to come into our heart and be our Savior. Uh, the plan of salvation just so simple right there in the very beginning, right after the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, here in chapter 4. You see that God's very concerned about people finding him as their savior. So the righteous accepting God's plan, that's the saved race, okay? Uh, that, and that's so important that we make sure that we're part of that saved race. They became unequally yoked with the world when they married into uh, Cain's family, when they married his daughters, if you please. A lot of things happened that were ungodly. It, it says several things about some of these were kind of famous in their day and time because of what had happened in this relationship that they had. But when we have a relationship with the devil, bad things are gonna happen. And sometimes the maiden how might look good for a time, but sooner or later, bad day's coming. They became unequally yoked with the world. And that's always dangerous when a Christian says, well, if we go ahead and have music that sounds like the world, we'll be able to draw more people in. And if we have some programs that are more entertaining, we'll be able to draw other people in. And if, you know, and they start just going through all these various compromises that we can do to reach the world. Let's become more like the world so we can reach the world. <laughs> uh, does that sound pretty familiar? But Mulan knows what else? Our flesh is weak and easily sidetracked by the tools and the servants of Satan. 
folks, but I, I think about the tools and safety, and uh, this may get a little personal, but can the TV be used as a tool for safety? Mm -hmm. uh, can our, our, our phones be used as a tool for safety? Can a, a laptop be used or a computer as a tool of safety? Mm -hmm. And can I can just go on and on and, and magazines and, and newspapers and stuff. But let me say this. Just a moment ago, Jerry was saying, what, we had 193 that what's the program on YouTube that our church put out showing people how they can save and how to get right with God? I'd say that's good. And would you say that the tool was being YouTube was being used for God's glory? Wow. Isn't it amazing? It, it's like with fire. You know, with fire, you can burn a slice house down. But with fire, you can also cook a pretty good meal. And George would tell us about his special father day ribs. He didn't bring any to us, but he had told us about. But what I'm trying to say is whatever God can use. It seems like the devil can also use her. Maybe I can say it a couple of ways, but simply, we need to make sure that we are not tools or servants of the devil. And again, am I saying that a saved person would be a servant of the devil? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Man, how many times did Peter <laughs> do something just really, really stupid and dumb, and yet we know he was saved, we know he was a believer, but how many times did you, oh, I go fishing, guys. Let's go fishing. Let's forget Jesus now. Let's go fishing. And, okay, Peter, what are you going to do? We'll go fishing. <laughs> they were supposed to go out fishing for souls, for men. We can go on. But what I'm saying is, yes, good people do bad things as they yield to Satan and his plans. So the Canaanites almost totally destroyed God's sons. And again, all that happened uh, just before, and that's no what's coming on the scene. And so we know something else. The Creator was disturbed by the actions of men. You ready? God hates sin. But let me go ahead and say this speedily, okay? God loves a sinner, but He hates sin. So don't think, well, I've sinned, so God can't love me anymore. That's not true. God loves you even though you have sinned. And God wants to help you to turn you away from sin because when we uh, get rid of sin in our life, then God can use us more for his honor, for his glory. And we can feel so much better about life when we're living a righteous life over living an unrighteous life. So God warned them here that he was going to sin and that there was a pending judgment that was coming in 120 years. Now, we've told several of y'all that, we're, Lord will, we're going to have a revival this coming Friday, a special meeting over in Warsaw, of all places. Uh, we're looking forward to going there. It was some great things that happened back years ago, back like 100 years ago or so. Exciting things happened in that part of the country. A great preacher named Billy Sunday. God used him in a tremendous way. He was a professional ball player, and of all things, became an alcoholic, and all sorts of things happened. But then he got saved one day. You see, he belonged to that lost race. Then he became part of the saved race, okay? And it just made a gigantic difference in his life. And so we'll be over there having this special meeting. And we've been telling you all for the last several months about this meeting coming up. And here God said, I'll give you 120 years to get right. 120 years. God never wanted to get right. I mean, that's ample time to get things right. Wouldn't you say 120 years? Of course, you might remember that people were living 900 years too. But he said, give me 120 years, repent, turn, get right. And so we see what happens. In Genesis 6 3, God shows us that he was so concerned. And how easy it would have been for God just to wash his hands of the whole line and said, man, okay, y'all are going to hell? Go ahead. I'm through with you. I've done all. And you refuse to listen to me. You just continue in your sinful ways. You continue to listen to the devil. I'm through with you. <laughs> but he went out of his way to save eight people. Folks, I don't know exactly how many people were on there. But it's possible there could have been as many as a billion people at that time. But he intervened and did everything, please. 
possible to save the whole world that only eight can save. And how easy it would have been. Only eight, it's just not worth it. But God, in his love and his mercy, did not let Satan to destroy all mankind. And so those eight souls were spared. We see the Savior comes with the plan of salvation. Genesis 3.15, and here we have the first promise. And this way back, Genesis chapter 3 is where man sinned. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, listen to God as he speaks to the woman, as he speaks to Eve, our great, 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 great grandmother. Hi, cousins. <laughs> okay. Notice what it says. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel referring to Satan and the things that he would do but referring to how God would be able to use the woman because to her sin was channeled into this world and she listened to Satan and she listened to the serpent so Satan used the woman to encourage the sin of man and guys women still influence us a whole lot don't they and uh, you know as you look in here I know the church is kind of using uh, but we always, well, we have quite some men in here as we do women. Okay, that's that's unusual. But anyhow, it's just part of a, okay. But what I'm saying is, uh, uh, how different this world would be without women, right? Would we want to live if, if we didn't have women? Or would we even be here if there weren't women? A lot of things to think about it. But God, in his plan, he worked it so that woman who had listened to the devil and then caused her husband to listen to the devil, he said, for you, I listen to Savior and Lord. Wow. God said, I will come through you. Wow, isn't that amazing? Do you think God forgave her of her sin? I think God forgave her of her sin. Do you think God used me? I mean, we wouldn't be here. I mean, and her name basically refers to the fact that she's the mother of all living. Well, she is. <laughs> We're all related back to Eve, okay? So all that said, she encouraged man in his sin. But the Savior used the woman to bring salvation to man. God uses the Jewish race to bring a Savior to us. That's the saved race again. But God converts non-Jewish women to his plan from the false race. Isn't it amazing seeing the grace of God in this? And, and when I say he took the, the lost race, in other words, the Jewish people have been particularly chosen to bring in the Savior of the world, okay? But God chose some women who were not Jewish to bring the Savior into the world through the Jewish race. Ooh, how can that be? Okay, I'm glad you had. Okay. Rahab was a Canaanite harlot, and yet she was the grandmother of King David and the great great grandmother of Jesus Christ. She was a harlot. Uh, well, they maybe understand she was a prostitute. How in the world could God use anybody like that? But wow, didn't she have a tremendous faith? I mean, that her husband was a, a Prince Solomon, he became her husband. And then we look at Ruth. And as we look at Ruth, again, she was a Moabite. And the, the way that her family and her tribe came together is just, it, it just, it's frightening because the father of the Moabites was also their grandfather. Okay, <laughs> we won't say that too long, okay? The, okay, and again, they were affected by Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow, isn't that amazing? what God could do, and God used Ruth. She married a man named Boaz, and he was a prince among the people of Israel, a very good God demanded. And then later on, we find that King David, he does something that's so terrible, he commits adultery with one of his mighty men, with one of his, uh, what they call special forces men. He commits adultery with this man's wife. She has a child, and of all minds, guess what? In the line of Jesus. Oh, wow. She was an adulteress, married to a Hittite. Wow. 
in an amazing what God can do. Don't we see his love, his grace, and his mercy throughout the scriptures? And I want to point out that those were all part of the lost race that became part of the saved race so that we could say, okay, isn't it fantastic? And then finally, which of the two races do you belong to? Yeah, it shouldn't be hard. Just simply, has there ever been a time that you asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart, and become the Lord and Savior? If you've done that, you're part of the saved race. Yay! Okay? But if you haven't, uh, we can change that now and make you part of that saved race. And it's so important. I mean, as we look at the scriptures, in an amazing what God can do as we look at these races again. Is it wrong to marry someone of a different race? Yes. Is that what? Yes. It is wrong. And what you do is you need to marry saved people. People of the same race. Okay. Uh, when I think of Levi and Jen, uh, Jen I think is one of the most beautiful women that you would ever meet. She's really just very effervescent Christian. Just amazing in so many ways. Uh, but you see, she was a sage, of the sage race. Thank the Lord that her parents are now part of the sage race too. But again, that's the important thing. No matter what your background might be, are you saved or are you lost? Not because of their color or ethnicity, but their relationship with God is what counts. God does not want us to be unequally yoked. <coughs> saved people need to marry saved people, and lost people need to marry lost people, okay? Of course, I want the lost people to get saved on this understanding, okay? I remember one time I had a couple showed up at my door, and uh, they said, we understand you're a preacher. I said, uh, yes, I'll go to Christ, fix that for something. And, and, and they were, and they just simply said, uh, so you can do weddings, right? I said, yeah, I can do funerals too. <laughs> I'm smart here. And so when they, I said that to them, they said, well, we want to get married, and we got $50 to give you right now. Oh, wow, I was so great with $10 to $50. <laughs> of course, back then it was something. And I said, well, let me ask you real fast, like, and this is so important, if you were to die today, what would happen to you? And they said, well, what's that got to do with getting married? And I said, well, I, I only marry people that are saved, and uh, I, I, I really can't marry the two of y'all. And... Uh, so they said, well, I think I'd say it, but I don't think she is. And I thought, oh, okay, great. <laughs> so, yeah, I said, well, I can not marry you. And so the man said, okay, just kind of like that. And she said, well, you sure are sorry. You sure are rotten. You call yourself a preacher? And then he looked at her and he looked at me and he said, this guy's got some convictions. And I don't see that very often. We'll go find somebody else to marry us. <laughs> okay. Whatever. Uh, but again, what I'm saying is, folks are going to have problems. If you marry a lost person, and, and I know one person, uh, Mom, you remember now, Jones, and uh, her mother said, Well, when I met her father, and I just fell in love, knew he was the one. But he wasn't a Christian, but I knew if he married me, I'd get him saved. Well, she did get him saved, and he ended up being a deacon. But I don't advise that, okay? Uh, Thank the Lord for his grace and his mercy. But again, we don't marry someone of a different race. If you're saved, you marry a saved person. If you're unsaved, you marry an unsaved person. So all that said, if someone is of the same faith, they are in the same race, okay? And I know we're all part of the human race, so to speak. But God can bless any race that is saved. No matter what your background is or what you know you come from, God can work in your life and do wonderful things if you're saved. Okay? But again, I, and it's great because I point out those that were blessed when I talk about uh, Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba and how God blessed them in such a wonderful way. But look at all the curse mixed up groups, okay? And when I say it, Samson Delilah, who that was a fact. <laughs> Uh, Ahab and Jezebel, oh man, Jezebel, we still, you know, a lot of people like to name their donkey Jezebel, but anyhow, uh, we don't have donkey, so we don't have one named Jezebel. 
But then you had Nabel and Abigail, uh, and we go on, and it just doesn't come out good uh, when these people mix together. All right? In God's sight, there are only two races. And God loves both, as I mentioned in the moment, John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoso believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We are to be separated from the lost in this lifestyle. But we should do all we can to reach them. Basically, what I'm telling you is that we need to make everybody of the same race that we are say, okay? <laughs> and do what we can to reach those that are lost before it's eternally too late and before they're lost for all eternity. You see, once they get saved, they're saved for all eternity. How fantastic. So. That's what I think would stop our, our racial problems in this country would be for all the lost people to get saved. I said, well, that's real simple. That's real profound. <laughs> that would make all the difference in the world. Uh, I have many a black brother, sister, and one that's brown and yellow, and I'm just going down this, all the different colors might want to give. And have a great relationship. Because we're of the same race. We're saved. <coughs> so I hope that I helped you with it. Do what you can to reach the lost. Bring them to the saving knowledge of Christ. And as some Jewish people could say, that ain't even a witch could say. You know, I mean, it's amazing what God can do. And I've seen a, a, a several Buddhists could say that Lord, our, uh, my son's uh, mother in law and, and uh, father in law, they would. Agnostic Buddhist, they got saved. You don't sit down, she's sweet already. She? So, but what I'm saying is, it's exciting when we see God working and how to bring everything together. So, you have the saved race. And I can't even call you brother, okay, or sister. You're that saved race. So, all that said, I trust that you'll thank all these things. And do what you can to bring others into our race, okay? That's the supreme race, it's the same race, it's the Christian race, okay? But don't get cocky, go, man, I'm a Christian, so I'm the number one race, okay? Don't do that, okay? That's the wrong approach. But do what you can. <coughs> so right now we want to go ahead and dismiss a prayer. Lord, thank you for this time that you come together and study your word and help us to see the answer to the race issue that we you're constantly being brought up in our country. Now it's caused so much division, so many problems. And you see Satan using it. You see uh, the politicians <coughs> using it for their benefit or to put somebody else down or whatever. Help us to see that you only see two separate races, and that's the lost and the saved. And help us to do what we can as a saved person to help lost people to become part of our race. That to, to get saved. And Lord, thank you again that you can and that you do want to work through us. Help us to make a difference in this world for the cause of Christ. We pray for someone here that's never asked you to forgive them of their sins. If they'll pray this simple childlike prayer and say, Dear God, please forgive me of all my sins and come into my heart and become my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all.